Welcome everyone to the Project ECHO West Victorian PHN Hub. Um, today is Tuesday the 6th of, July, 6th of June 2023 and this is the third session of Series 4 of the Spider ECHO Project. And our session today is entitled Impact of Diet, Part 1. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways from which we're zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience and the ongoing place First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respect to the elders, both past and present, and commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support the self-determination of First Nations peoples and organisations and we'll work together on closing the gap. So my name is Robert Ward and I'm a GP and the facilitator of the sessions. And I'm also the father of a 26-year-old, the West Vic PHN spider team. They've been working hard to increase the accessibility of health services to people with intellectual disability across our region. We know that there are many barriers to access these services, and these echo sessions are to be a forum where primary, care, primary healthcare professionals can explore issues. And we've looked at issues like annual health assessments, dual diagnosis, reasonable adjustments, use of behaviour support practitioners and medication. And today we're going to explore how diet and how, and how diet can affect the people uh, with intellectual disability, both their health and their well-being, and what we can do as primary care care practitioners um, in that space. So I'd just like to um, start with um, the etiquette slide. Um, we can certainly um, there is a um, a link in the chat to sort of more details. Um, but you can certainly use the chat if you want to ask some questions. Um, I'd just like to, to just to maintain that for the case study, we will sort of think privacy is an important thing. Um, the didactic presentation will be recorded for people to look at later, um, but we won't be recording the um, case discussions just from a privacy point of view. So talking about case, case discussions, the ECHO, Project ECHO is all about case discussions. Um, oh, there we go. So if you've got a case study uh, or an example you'd like to um, discuss uh, with colleagues and with the experts on these panels, please feel free to submit it um, to the team. You can find a link there um, in the link or just on the on the screen there. Um, and we can arrange and um, really show you how to present these case studies. And it's really interesting getting case studies from our community to um, explore some of the sessions that we're doing. Um, quick reminder about professional development. Um, the opportunities there, you can contact the workforce development team at the West Vic PHN um, about getting your points. I think we can all, GPs can sort of self-log stuff now. And that's quite useful for doing that. Um, there is a survey. Um, before the session, so if people would like to do that um, beforehand, it helps the spider team sort of know um, where we're going and how to improve the sessions. So I'll get onto our agenda for the, for the session today. So we're going to be having a didactic presentation by Dr. Helen McCarthy. Um, she's the Deputy Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching at the College of Sport, Health and Engineering at Victoria University, and she's got extensive cl extensive clinical experience. Um, in paediatrics um, as a, as a specialising in nutrition support across a, a range of clinical areas. And um, we have a panel member. We've got uh, Marjorie Pithouse, who's the practice manager, um, at, who's a practice advice manager for the shared care and, and respite living at GenU with a wide experience of looking after people with intellectual disability in housing. Um, and our case presentation uh, will be through from Monica Wellington, who's a practicing dietitian and a PhD researcher at the Victorian University, um, looking around our food and nutrition for people with intellectual disability and exploring the food environments um, which surrounds them. So we've got some learning outcomes for today. Um, probably the same as what they've been every session, um, really to uh, recall um, Recall the terminology when describing intellectual disability and developmental disabilities to identify solutions uh, to support primary, uh, primary health care professionals to deliver high quality health care. Um, 
to assess the disparities in the health inequities across our service for people with intellectual disability, um, to know the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Persons with a Disability, and of course to look how we can use reasonable adjustments um, in our practice um, and clinical settings. So, um, so we do have some learning outcomes for this session today. So understand the importance of diet and nutrition for people with a disability and to plan and justify local actions to improve diet and nutrition for people with disabilities. So we're going to get, get moving with the session. Please, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat um, if you like, so, so we know who you are. Um, and I'm going to, in a, in a moment, just introduce um, Helen. So, because for today's presentation, we're going to hear from Dr. Helen McCarthy, who's going to speak about the impact of diet. And I suppose as a GP, I've never given much thought to the diet of my patients with intellectual disability. But when you think about it and preparing for tonight, I thought there's probably a lot of things we need to consider, and it's a very important subject. From patients having very limited variety in their diets, sensitivity to colours or textures, conditions that may make them over or under eat, food poor literacy of our patients with intellectual disability to make good food choices. A lot of our time, our patients with intellectual disability may depend on others for their food choice from parents and carers who don't have any formal nutritional training. And I'm, um, I'm sure there's a lot of behaviour control used by foods, by the carers and by parents over time. I've certainly given a few flu shots with the promise of McDonald's and a can of Coke. Um, and it's quite effective, but I'm sure it's not a long-term solution. Um, often activities can of all around food. A lot of people go out for coffee and cake and, um, and that seems to be an important part of socialization, but without may maybe a sound nutritional basis and maybe without that overarching um, oversight into what people, what people are eating in their health goals. Um, and even sort of within a, within a care home when you get lots of different people um, involved in making food choices for people. Um, and there's also lots of medications that we prescribe that can affect diet and metabolic risk and cause constipation and other side effects. So a lot of traps in there for general practice as well. So I'm really looking forward to hearing um, what Helen has to say today. And I'm sure we'll touch on some of these subjects. And we'll have some time for questions afterwards and feel free to say to use the chat. So I'm going to hand over to you, Helen. Welcome. Thank you very much, Robert. And um, good evening, everybody. It's nice to have the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, so just sort of to give you a little bit of background um, about what I plan to cover this evening um, and the approach I've taken. Um, uh, as Robert says, my background is as a clinically practicing dietitian. And I worked in um, pediatrics for nearly 20 years before moving into academia. And as part of that, I worked very closely with children and their families across a range of disabilities um, and um, in the food space. Um, it presents with a huge spectrum of problems, as um, has already been alluded to. So I'm going to vaguely touch on a few of those tonight. This is by no means comprehensive coverage of the topic. Um, okay. Okay. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of the traditional owners of the land on which we are situated um, and also recognize that their um, knowledge and wisdom around food, diet and health um, is something that we should be learning from and incorporating into our practices as we move forward um, and provides great insights. Okay, so what I'm planning to try and cover by the end of the next few minutes um, is to actually try and get across why diet and nutrition is so important for people with disabilities. Um, and also to look at um, trying to get uh, you to think about strategies that you could use locally that might improve the diet and nutrition for people with disabilities. So things that can be done by GPs, by nurse practitioners, by um, care staff, by families. Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of 
nutrition and food decisions where people are disability with disabilities are concerned are not made by them they're made by those around them um, and robert's already alluded to that so why is nutrition important um well it's not just because i'm a dietitian and i think and it's what i it's my bread and butter and it's what i've spent way too long studying and talking about but in people with disabilities they're twice a, twice as likely uh, to develop a chronic health condition. So things like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, as people without disability. Um, that, and diet is a risk factor for many of these conditions. So by improving the diet and the food choices that people make, we can actually potentially impact on reducing the risk of a lot of chronic conditions. Um, and when you're living with a disability yourself or when you're putting somebody as a, a family or a care, family member or a carer of somebody that has a disability, um, the additional complications of managing something like type two diabetes, managing cardiovascular disease risk becomes um, hugely compounded and extremely challenging. Um, the psychological health, diet is actually, diet and, psycho and psychological health are strongly linked. Now, we it's a very complex relationship and we don't fully understand it at the moment, but there is good evidence out there that shows that um, diets that are high in what we generally consider to be um, less healthy food options, so things that are high in saturated fats, high in added sugars, high in salt, those kind and low in fruits and vegetables and whole grains, those diets are actually directly related to somebody's mental health and their ability to cope with situations. And I'm sure everybody is well, well aware of their own um, situations where they're having a bad day and that bar of chocolate or that tub of ice cream sounds really really good and so we use food to make ourselves feel better but actually quite often the foods we choose to make ourselves feel better do give us a sugar rush so give us a sense of of uh, euphoria in the short term but in the longer term can have very lasting negative effects on our mental health the other thing that um nutrition plays a huge role in is our social and personal and cultural identity. Um, Robert mentioned um, McDonald's and a Coke for getting kids to have uh, vaccinations. And yes, we do. We increasingly use food as a coercion or a bribe or a reward for appropriate behavior. Um, as a pediatric dietitian, I used to say bribery and corruption worked every time. But one of my roles was it was never around food. It was always something else. It was usually a coloring book or a game or a trip to somewhere. Um, <laughs> but it is something that if you're trying to manage somebody's behavior, quite often we do do it with food because people have favorite foods that can be used to do that. Um, food is a very emotive subject. Um, parents instinctively want to ensure that their children eat well um that um and parents of children who are placed nil by mouth so require enteral feeding through a tube have frequently reported a grieving process um and increased levels of stress so diet for the person with the disability is hugely important but actually it has a much wider impact because if the diet is not right for the entire circle, social circle of that individual, then it compounds all the challenges and the problems. Um, and bottom line, mealtimes are where we develop many of our social skills. Um, and it is a social, it is a, um, a pleasant experience. But if you by, if you have somebody that is aversive towards certain textures, that um, struggles with being around a lot of noise and a lot of buzz, which a mealtime could be, then 
the mealtime becomes stressful for them, stressful for those around them, which then impacts on what is actually eaten and drunk. Um, Nutrition is also really important um, for um, uh, how we identify when there's a nutrition problem is really important. So we've got um, the need to identify a risk. So anybody that's working with people with an intellectual disability, so that would be, or a physical disability, um, and that could be healthcare professionals, it could be social support staff, it could be families and carers, need to have tools at their fingertips where they can identify when the person is not consuming what they should be and can therefore take action. So we know from the research evidence, 47% of people with an intellectual disability don't eat enough fruit and vegetables. 72% of, and these are adult figures, 72% are overweight or obese. And these are figures from 2018, 2019 in Australia. Um, when we're working with individuals with a disability, we need to um, we need to make sure that they're receiving the support that they need. So that means collaborative working across the professionals, referrals on to others who may be able to provide additional support for the individuals and their families and those that are caring for them. Um, but also, it's about including them in that um, in the discussions, in the planning, in the, um, in the goals and the actions. So you're talking very much about having the clients at the center of all the discussions and party to all those discussions so that they, they, they understand and can take on board um, some responsibility and some sense of self-efficacy around their own well-being and their own food choices. Um, so we know that at least 38% of people with a disability see three or more professionals for the same condition. So for something like type two diabetes, that could be their GP, that could be a dietitian, that could be a diabetes educator. Um, it could be that they're also seeing an exercise physiologist or a podiatrist. Or, and if you've got all these different professions working independently, then it becomes very challenging for the individuals and those that support them to actually take on board the advice around diet and support the people to, to actually make the right food choices. Um, communication is the biggest problem here, and we need to be better at communicating with people with intellectual disabilities and physical disabilities, we need to be better at uh, communicating with the people that support and care for them. And we need to be better at communicating amongst ourselves so that we're giving one cohesive, clear message, particularly around diet, because there is so much misinformation out there about diet. Um, 30%, the figures say 30% need health, help with their health care. And this includes their diet and their food choices. Um, but of that 30%, 47% are making, so almost half are only receiving informal support. So they're not getting um, formal support or formal um, uh, assistance that actually will help them to make appropriate food choices and um, manage their health condition. Um, the other thing to consider when we're talking about what is important when we're dealing with nutrition is a food first approach. Um, it can be very easy where food is challenging and healthy food choices are challenging to just prescribe somebody medication. So, for example, um, an individual that has a requires a, a modified texture diet but for whatever reason and presents with constipation, it's very easy to give them um, uh, laxative medications rather than to actually look at what can we do around the food. Um, with people that have aversions to particular types of foods, um, again, it's very easy to just say, oh, you're anemic, let's give you an iron supplement, rather than actually looking at what they're eating and giving them some advice around that, as well as initially maybe an iron supplement, but with a plan to phase that out. 
I always say nutrition is everybody's responsibility. I'm a dietitian. I am considered to be an expert in the field, but I by no means think that I'm the only person that can do this. And I can't. As a dietitian, I cannot do my job without the support of everybody else that is around the individual that requires um, support around nutrition. So that's other medical and healthcare staff. So that's where we should be screening for risk, um, screening for obesity risk, screening for chronic disease risks that might be related to diet and actually thinking about diet in that screening process. Um, and um, also screening for undernutrition uh, because a good proportion of individuals with disability um, present either as being underweight or may present with micronutrient deficiencies that they may be obese or overweight um, based on BMI, but their diet is so imbalanced that they are missing out on key micronutrients. So screening for risk is really important. And part of that is actually asking people about what they're eating, what they're not eating and the amounts they're consuming. Um, and I rely heavily on all these other health professionals to actually make referrals to me as a dietitian to be able to provide that person with the bespoke individualized advice that, that I can offer. Um, communities, families and carers have a really important role to play as well. Um, in that the access to healthy food options is usually controlled by somebody else. So one of the things, uh, we work on a couple of projects at VU, and you'll have seen them mentioned in the slide earlier, which are the CHU program and the um, menu program. And these are both, uh, these are, CHU is aimed at individuals. Um, uh, a lot of our clients are individuals with intellectual disability. Um, and Menu is a, a training program that focuses on um, the carers and families and support staff. And both the programs aim to include what we refer to as food literacy. So that's um, increasing the, an individual's ability to plan, select, prepare and eat healthier food options. So if they're not able to do all of those steps themselves, we need the people around them to be able to do those effectively. So in Australia, we know that around 60% of the population has poor food literacy. Um, so they're not able to plan, select, prepare, uh, and choose um, healthy food options. So it's important that we need to educate individuals to be able to um, to make these choices and these activities themselves, but also to educate the people that support them to be able to do those. Um, and from the individual's point of view, and what we've seen repeatedly in the CHU program, which is cooking and he cooking, healthy eating and wellness is what it stands for, um, is around self-efficacy. So the confidence of the individuals that come to the program, that over a four week period to be able to cook um, healthy food choices, to know how to choose between two different types of food for something that is going to be lower in fat, lower in salt, lower in um, added sugars. And my final point, I suppose, is comes back to how do we make all this happen? If we want to improve if we want to increase the profile of nutrition, if we want to improve the nutrition of the people that we are supporting in whatever role we have, how do we actually do that? Um, and my belief is by education. Um, we need people, we need health professionals to understand what is normal eating, what is a normal diet, what are the normal requirements for somebody of a particular age and gender? Um, so that when they're talking to them, they can identify where they're not doing what's normal, what's recommended. Um, we need to educate people on the relationships between diet and disease. So how diet can prevent or be used to manage certain conditions. And we need to increase the food literacy of health professionals as well as families and carers and individuals so that they can plan and manage foods within budgets, 
budget's a big thing at the moment, but plan and manage healthy food selection within budgets that they can actually make informed decisions around what is a healthy food, that they can prepare it and cook it and that they can enjoy eating it. So if we are talking about um, modifying texture or somebody that has an aversion or an allergy to a certain type of food, it's about giving them the skills and the self-efficacy and giving the people around them the skills and the self-efficacy to actually be able to make healthy food choices now and into the future. So my takeaways is everybody has a role to play. Education is important and we need to be providing more educational resources and support resources to help people plan, manage, prepare, um, select and eat healthy foods. That's staff, carers um, and individuals. Um, we need to ensure that we're communicating and we're collaborating with the individual as the um, center of all that communication, all that collaboration, all that discussion and decision making. And we also need to think about a food first approach, because again, as I've already said, many people have um, their multiple medications that they're taking, there's interactions between foods and medication. Um, so if we can do it with diet, which should be a pleasurable and much easier experience than taking a medicine, then we should do it that way. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. That's that's great. It's such a huge subject, isn't it? And I suppose, I mean, where do we all learn about food? We probably learn about it from our parents and school and what's out there in the media. There isn't isn't a lot of formal training for, for the average parents. If you think about um, carers and parents and things like that, especially when they're thrust into the world of having a disabled child or um, mm -hmm. things like that, it can be, it can be very daunting. And, you know, the things that you learn um, or you thought you knew and then your child doesn't eat certain things and throws it all on the head. It can be quite overwhelming, isn't it? Certainly Absolutely. The, certain, the certain thing is, is a, as a GP, probably a diet and dietitian is probably quite down my list of things that I think about. And I'm just being brutally honest, that's what <laughs> um, we talk through in this program, doing sort of annual health assessments, particularly with the CHAP tool that does does highlight the, at least for us to think annually about diet and that, yeah, it's a, there's a tick box there. So, um, so where can we get help? Just, just, I suppose I'm thinking, do people with intellectual disability, a lot of them have a dietitian input or would you find a lot just don't? That's sort of down the bottom of everyone's priority list. I think Monica might have a better perspective on this, but um, my understanding is that it really depends on um their funding and the priority that is put to that. So it may be that um, there are other things seen as higher priorities. So to, pay, to spend the, the, the funding on and therefore they are um, diet and seeing a dietitian gets pushed right down to the bottom of the list. And seeing a dietitian can be quite expensive if you're going to do it privately as well. Um, which is also um, a barrier to um, to people making use of of that resource. Um, so, I say from my perspective, um, I would love to see funding available for education programs that can be put together to provide the general information for families and carers um, and support staff um, around what is good nutrition and what and and how to actually um get that embedded in in somebody's lifestyle and routine which can be really really challenging um particularly if they're versive for example somebody with um on the autistic spectrum can be really restrictive in the types of foods they'll eat 
the patterns those foods have to be put out to on a plate, the plate that the food has to be on. I mean, I've, I've known children where mom has literally bought 20 versions of the same plate because that's the only plate the child will eat off. And if that plate gets broken, the child won't eat for a week uh, or longer. Um, so, you know, those are those are challenges that we don't necessarily think about when we talk about nutrition, but it's a really real problem to a lot of families and I think my experience has always been that while as a diet pediatric dietitian my role was around improving the di- looking after the diet and nutrition requirements of the child that I was managing but 90% of what I was actually doing was supporting the family in their nutrition and how to integrate what they're doing into how their child eats so that the two at some point in the future might actually meet. (laughs) That's great. So I wonder before we do a case study, whether anyone else had any sort of questions or comments or anything about um, about what Helen's had to say. Marjorie, can I ask you with, with Jen, you do do staff get sort of formal training? Is that sort of something Mm -hmm. that, I was thinking of a lot of those sorts of issues while um, Helen was talking and I made myself some notes at the time. Um, Robert, no, people do not get formal training. Most people in the state who work as a disability support worker in a you know, registered organisation have either done the Certificate 4 in disability or the Certificate 3 in disability. They don't learn anything about nutrition. They don't learn anything about um, cooking. Mm-hmm. And we make some huge assumptions. We employ people to be you know, good support workers. But what does that mean? We often then discover they absolutely don't know how to cook. Now, we're talking about people who live in 24-hour-a-day um, accommodation and have um, intellectual disabilities or other disabilities. It means every single person we provide support to requires assistance with managing their food, choosing their food, cooking their food, selecting their food, and a lot of people eating their food as well. And yet there's, there's no training on nutrition in the current Certificate for course that people do. Um, And we've also discovered as time's gone on, I think we've even got more and more staff now who really don't have much of a clue themselves about cooking. They really don't. Um, Sometimes uh, we have some people from um, called backgrounds who might say, say, oh, I don't know how to cook anything that these people would like, you know, but which is just crazy because, of course, everyone loves to eat a whole range of foods, unless, of course, Helen is a person with autism who's really stuck and they've got to eat only white food or yellow food or whatever, you know, the, the colours dictate what they eat. But, you know, some some staff don't feel that they can actually offer, um, you know, a whole range of different sorts of foods that the people they provide support to would love to eat and would love to learn to cook themselves. I also think that what people really pick up in their training and what is um, very much pushed in terms of theory is choice and I'm 100% all over choice, but that's often what staff will use as an excuse for not um, really pushing um, a person into a corner where they think there's going to be, um, you know, some sort of fight about the food or resistance to the food or or actual physical fighting. Um, so they'll say, oh, it's okay, that's that person's choice. They don't want to eat anything except this, this, and this. They only want chips. They only want whatever. And so staff who are lazy, and I always say that to them, they're being very lazy in their approach if they think that accepting that it's a person's choice to eat chips for their dinner every night. You know, like that's just completely unsatisfactory. Um, So I suppose where we do get into some training around that is our associations, the the small association and ongoing association we hope we'll have with Monica and Helen. And the other thing is that we use a training program about zero tolerance for abuse and neglect of people in care. And we have to actually present that not providing healthy food choices and not providing um, information and education around food is actually abuse and neglect. And the other way we, we approach this issue is through our Oral Health Champions program that we run at GNU, where we have a partnership with Dental Health Services Victoria, and we train staff 
every year. Um, they, every, a, a staff member from every house has the chance each year to be trained in oral health, which, surprise, surprise, is often about good nutrition and about looking after your mouth and, and eating good food and drinking lots of water. And Robert, you touched yourself on one of our biggest problems at the moment, which I don't think is so much with the staff who work in houses supporting groups of people, but probably more with staff who are employed to come in and provide social opportunities, supporting people out into the community. And you mentioned yourself the coffee and cake. And I don't think coffee and cake is anything to do with socialisation. I think coffee and cake is, again, lazy staff members. Um, the whole point of the funding through the NDA is for people being supported one-on-one -on -one to go out into the community is to make community connections. And just going out and sitting at a coffee, having a coffee and cake while the worker looks at their phone and the person sits and looks around and drinks their coffee and has their piece of cake is nothing to do with what the NDAs have actually intended. Mm. So, there's my answer. <laughs> Thanks, Marjorie. If there's no other questions, we might move um, on to Monica uh, for a case presentation, and hopefully that'll sort of stimulate some more discussion because it's a really interesting subject. I'd just like to thank um, Helen and Monica and Marjorie um, for their fantastic insight today. It's certainly given me lots of things to think about with, with my patients. Um, and especially with my um, relationship with, with Gateway Support Services and the houses there. So there'll be a few things I'll be bringing to the table there, Marjorie, and I might get in contact with you at some stage. Um, um, I'd like to, to thank everyone for attending. We'd like to remind you of the Health Pathways, um, that slides there that has some connections to, to resources for, with intellectual disability. Um, I'd like to thank the SPIDER team. Um, with, um, with Kerry and Nicole here today and the SPIDER project, um, helping people with intellectual disability access some healthcare. Um, remind people of case studies um, for the future. And there's an evaluation slide as well, which I think we can log on to and the connections in the, in the chat. Um, so I'd like to remind everyone um, of the next SPIDER Echo in a, in a fortnight's time, we were gonna see the impact of diet part two. So looking forward to seeing everyone there. So thanks for joining us um, tonight and look forward to seeing you in, in a fortnight's time.